Hi folks, thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, our last breakout session here before we, uh, we, we get into the, uh, the plenary uh, discussions. My name's uh, Pedro Mokri and I'm one of the organizers of this event. Um, and actually a, a, a Stanford grad myself. I uh, was one of Jim Sweeney's PhD students back in the day. And I actually helped uh, um, him put together the Precord Institute for Energy Efficiency. So energy efficiency is actually a topic that's near and dear to my heart personally. And, uh, and one of the, the things that, that's interesting about efficiency is now it's becoming a, a, a big theme and a big thesis in a lot of aspects. Um, because as people are talking about energy, that there's, there's less discussions um, also, you know, other than the one that we had this, this uh, lunch session on, on nuclear, but it's less and less discussions on the supply side and more focus on the demand side. And this year for the first time, we're actually thinking about, well, what does it look like when you think of the broad picture of how energy is actually consumed and what we do with it, in particular when you think about the notion of cities. And so this is the, the first time ever that we're actually trying to do a very specific theme um, at the Energy Summit um, focused on digital cities and hopefully it'll be the first of many. And I'm extremely honored and pleased to have um, a distinguished panel up here with me, um, folks that are actual true experts when it comes to the notion of digital cities and smart cities and I'll let them make their own introductions. And, uh, uh, ideally, because especially since we have a, a tight audience and a small audience here, uh, we want to keep it a conversation as much as we can versus just me asking questions. So, so the threat is that if you don't ask questions, then I just continue to talk. And so we don't want that to happen. Um, so, so with that, I'll, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Rich, uh, Mike, and Jay and have you guys just say a few words. And then Jay has uh, some slides that he'd like to show as well. Should we begin with Jay? Jay, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Jay Witherspoon, and I'm with CH Toom Hill. I, in my past life, I was the uh, program manager for Mazdar City, which is in the Abu Dhabi United Arab Emirates, and it was going to be one of the first sustainable cities in the world. And so we took a lot of lessons from that. My talk is, I wanted to kind of set the panel stage is kind of old thinking is really not working. We still have time to make changes. So in the old thinking, if you were all farmers, and let's pretend that you are farmers, uh, you would be wanting to grow a crop, right? And all you would really worry about in California today is water. Energy is pretty cheap. And carbon, what's carbon? Oh, I don't know what that is. That's something that happens in Australia or New Zealand or in Europe. And so you go along and, uh, and that's the old thinking. The new thinking which I'm proposing you to kind of step back and look at is you need water. The water has to be pumped to your, uh, your farm and you also may have to treat the uh, rainfalls that come off there or the water in, in, that comes off your uh, runoff, off your farm product. So now you need to think about how you're going to manage that. And then energy. Well, you need energy to pump that water to your uh, farm. You also need uh, energy to treat any type of wastewater or stormwater that comes on your farm. And then carbon. So what does carbon really mean? Well, carbon could be a sink, or it could be a uh, carbon footprint positive. If it's a positive, you might be growing a re uh, renewable product such as bamboo. And so you need to think about, okay, bamboo is working quite well for me. I could have a carbon sink for that, or I get carbon credit for that. And if I was growing some other products, that might be a carbon sink, meaning I'm growing a product not adequately proper for that environmental climate that you're dealing with. So the new thinking is really kind of balance all those three. And um, what I kind of want to do is I won't tell you how to do it, but I'll leave you with a question. And the question is, why would you grow dates in the middle of a desert? And so you could put any food product you want in there, but why would you grow it in a climate that's not suitable for that? And so that's the old thinking. And the new thinking is, let's think about carbon footprint when we look at the whole uh, approach of going forward. Another area to kind of look about is new cities are really based on mega trends. We're seeing a lot of rapid urbanization, People are coming back to the cities. We're seeing a lot of modernization going on. We're seeing a lot of environmental improvement. When you come back to the city, you want to have uh, a clean environment. You want to have, make sure that you're healthy. You could go outside and enjoy yourself. And also, we're seeing a lot more social citizenship, which means that we need to figure out the diversity and how we move forward. So those mega cities uh, of the future might be uh, compact. They'll have a lot of integration. They'll have a lot of resource efficiency, and they have to be sustainable. This is an example of what we did some work at Mazdar City. So you're seeing a combination of, of um, 
solar panels, along with uh, designs that allow you to, uh, for example, cooling is a, a major component in a lot of the environment. So you need to have air conditioning almost year round in, in the desert. And so to help offset that, we did some passive controls where you have shading on a porch and then your window is behind that, but you always have the ability to feel like you get some direct sunlight. And the shading allows you to reduce the amount of cooling demand because the, the building as it's exposed to sun is, is much cooler. That middle part right in here, this is an Arabic uh, chimney. So it takes the hot air down in this area uh, from the chimney and pulls it, uh, hot, air, uh, hot air from there, pulls it through the chimney and cools it off as you go. And we, we got so fancy that we added a temperature gauge coloring on the lights to show you as the hot air came at the top, it got cooler as it came back down. Some of the areas of focus are really uh, solid state lighting, uh, sustainable data collection and city operation management, uh, looking at solar thermal heating and cooling, uh, security and green supply chain. Kind of thinking about new thinking on uh, water, and I have water energy carbon nexus, is uh, it's really the old ways aren't gonna work. The conventional water and wastewater treatment are heavily ener energy intensive. So this curve kind of shows you, you get, this is the energy use over here and this is water demand as we go forth with reductions to try and get down to some of the levels we heard in the session uh, earlier next door is you can only get so far with water conservation and then you have to reapply energy because you're now dealing with more impaired waters and waters that need further treatment like salt water or waters that are contaminated with hydrocarbons. And you can see your energy level coming back up even though you're getting closer to the 100% re water reclamation. This dotted line is represents some of the innovations that you need such as solar power, solar, uh, solar thermal heating, uh, reverse osmosis, those type of things to get your water so that you're reducing your energy and also meeting your water needs. Next is we do a lot of stove pipes uh, city planning. We uh, have a separate group for parks and recs. We have a separate group for uh, wastewater. We have a separate group for um, wastewater treatment. And so what I'm suggesting, I'll show you a further slide, is that we have to have an integrated approach that really looks at the resource balancing and so that you don't have a winner or a loser. So you may take that impaired water and you have to use more energy but you need that water for something else. So you have to look at the full balance and there will always be a winner and loser in that balance, whether it's the energy, carbon, or the uh, water side of it. And then kind of thinking beyond just accepting uh, past practices, I did some work for the uh, Qatar 2020 uh, World Championship. And one of the ideas is it was supposed to happen during the summertime, now they moved it to the fall, which is the first time that Paya had done that, is to put a drone cloud that allows the shading of the area here versus having direct uh, cooling, such as air conditioning at your seat. So one of the ideas is to put the, the sun's right here, you have this nice drone cloud uh, blocking the sun so that it will keep the temperature down in the stadium and you could be able to keep the, the game to go forward. So you need to think about some pa past practices and go way beyond that. So another area is the new systems really have to be uh, uh, optimize the total water sources for the city. So you want to build a new digital city, but you need to also look at the, how the water is being supplied and also what happens to the water as it goes back into the receiving stream. So you want to come up with a solid balance that looks all your input outputs and how you would manage that city as you move forward so that's sustainable. And a lot of times the digital cities, the brand new ones, will be out in the middle of the wilderness. So you really need to, have to think about that and then thinking about how you would also manage your brown, uh, brownstone cities as you move forward. So you have to kind of think about the whole cycle of water. And then the last slide I have is this one water concept for Smart Digital City really looks at its generation, conversion, integration, and system balances and distribution. So you need to do a total balance on the energy side, on the uh, potable water side, and on how you manage your wastewater treatment as you move forward. Again, this is a, a picture of Mazdar City, but we came up with an integration model that allowed us to balance out who won and who lost. And so we're able to come up with a way that we would balance the city out so we could get closer to carbon neutrality, both in the operation of carbon as well as in the embedded carbon. Mazdar City wanted to take into account for all the embedded carbon that's in the buildings as well as its operating carbons that are used to convert the waste and, or treat the water or generate electricity and then make that neutral, pure carbon neutral instead of just looking at operating carbon. That's all I had to kind of open up the door and get people to start thinking about it. Perfect. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Steve.
Mike, feel free to sit if you want. Okay. Yeah. So um, my name is Michael Steep, and I'm Senior Vice President for Global Business Operations for Xerox PARC. Uh, PARC is a noted innovation center that has done a lot of work in the technology space. And I also have other roles, including sitting on um, the Greater London Authority's uh, Smart City Board. So the City of London um, decided several years ago that they wanted to do a overview of all the technology that was being developed within the city, including in infrastructure, and have an oversight board that would essentially help them figure out how to solve a number of digital cities problems. So they spend, um, they have a budget of roughly 200 billion US dollars a year, which are being spent right now on rather significant uh, infrastructure development within the city and also on digital technologies. They've also put together a series of incubators um, that are what I would call crossing the chasm of data. So the eventual goal and vision of the Smart City Board is basically to uh, cross data layers throughout the city. So a data layer, for example, might be the subterranean utilities, um, the water uh, supply and energy supplies with surface data, including things like um, Telefonica and O2, cellular data on people and people movement to airspace. So the interesting thing about the board is, for the first time, they're actually able to do a 35,000 foot view of what is happening throughout the city and see coordination, which is providing insights into how to better manage the investment dollars that they're spending uh, across the board. Uh, one of the major issues that we experience here in the United States is that our definition of a smart city uh, pales in comparison to what some of the European and Asian um, uh, cities are actually undertaken and have undertaken in the last couple of years. So as an example of that, um, the global spend for infrastructure development uh, last year was roughly $4 trillion. 6% of that is technology embedded spend, which means technology being employed in the infrastructure to do things like monitoring, heat monitoring, and so forth. And that percentage is likely to double in the next several years. So one of the uh, disconnects that has occurred is that in the United States at least, uh, so if you talk to the city of San Francisco or some of the cities uh, in the Bay Area, uh, the level and magnitude of investment in Europe is beyond belief compared to what we do here. Part of that is because of the tax uh, funding, the infrastructure is very different in how they fund all of this. But secondly, what's really remarkable is that here in Silicon Valley, with all this technology disruption, we aren't looking at how to do investment in a way that would actually support some of these monetizable projects abroad to increase the embeddedness of technology. So a lot of people are simply unaware of what is happening uh, abroad. And secondly, in this valley, with all the money and technology and expertise, there's almost no focus that's being put on figuring out how to get digitally enabled technologies uh, to help cities build and cross that chasm of data layers. So I'll give you an example of one creative project that's underway um, and what happens at these crazy board meetings. And they are kind of crazy at times. There's 22 members, uh, mostly corporate members. Park's role in that is actually to advise on emerging technology. Uh, one example. So one question that came up from the city, is it possible for us to essentially move uh, heat from the tube into the buildings, reducing carbon footprint, taking the credits from that, and then offering to buy Starbucks coffees for people who are traveling, in other words, use commuters as thermostats and regulate the time that they actually hit the tube. So uh, that project has now been funded and one of the major implications of that is, um, building on Jay's comment, is that the carbon element is monetizable. And uh, in addition to that, one of the major objectives of the Smart City Board, and the reason it's called Smart City is because IBM coined that term many, many years ago. I think it's a misnomer, actually. I prefer to use digitized city or digi digitally enabled city. I think it's a much more accurate term. You don't become smart until you actually do something. And so uh, and I, I don't think we should actually claim the adjective as ours unless we're significant. Um, and so, you know, the idea of monetization and how to build predictable models is built into a number of the projects. 
So let me give you an example of a couple other things, um, just briefly, and then I'll, I'll pass the torch a bit to Rich and crew. Um, one example is the Crossrail project. How many people in this room know about the Crossrail project? At about three or four out of the audience. You're not alone. Actually, that's more higher percentage than if you went into our venture community. So the Crossrail project is one of the largest construction projects underway in Europe. 14 billion pounds, that's roughly 20 plus billion US dollars, to construct a high-speed train system under the, quote, ancient city of London, connecting up all of the train uh, stations that come into the city with Europe so that you can make a journey, for example, from Manchester to Brussels or to Paris seamlessly. So that high-speed uh, system that's being built under the city, uh, I think over 150 kilometers of new tunnel, will also employ digitally enabled signage called follow me signage. So for example, when I leave my home in Cambridge and I'm on my smartphone, and I decide to move on to my journey, and I come to London, and I get on a Crossrail station, which is the first one scheduled to open next year, it follows me to give me information about my journey and to customize it. And then when I enter the escalator and go down into the station, digital signage follows me. So it actually talks to me as I'm going down the escalator, panel to panel, so it informs me. So for example, if I'm going to Brussels, and it turns out that I'm going to be at a particular location, it might tell me about tourists, and then the person behind me sees information that's relevant to them, but not to me. Follow me entertainment, so to speak, or directions. So concepts like this and prototyping um, is well underway. A approximately a billion pounds worth of sensor technology uh, and technology in general built into the total project. Now what venture capitalists in this valley wouldn't kill to get a billion dollar opportunity to develop some new sensor capability? Well, the first thing is you actually have to know that it exists. And that's one of the two, you know, the $200 uh, billion dollars worth of projects underway in the city right now. Others include a complete virtualization model, a data model of the city of London in real time, so that you can actually measure physical information against virtual information to see how the city is actually functioning. And another long-term goal is to have a complete unity of systems so that when vehicles with LTE networks in the United States or vehicles abroad with their equivalent wireless capability will be able to interconnect directly with the city systems and seamlessly you'll be able to see all of the traffic patterns and redirect them, which means that the privacy issue is going to become a real, well, it's not even a, an issue, it's a non-issue because there won't be any privacy if the system develops as we think it will with the commercial companies involved. So in the United States, uh, a lot of the car manufacturers are developing these wireless systems uh, but there hasn't been a crossing of the data chasm yet, which will, you know, is occurring in London and some of the other areas you know, on a testing basis. So when we think about this, it's really interesting. And then lastly, I think the other major area is emerging technology. There is some really revolutionary stuff happening um, in material sciences and in <coughs> predictive analytics. So I'll give you an example. And we are looking at new metamaterials that just the structure of the material itself can harvest energy from the atmosphere and self-power and become its own disruptor without the innate craziness of printed circuits and power and everything else that you normally would have to do to put in a tunnel. So in our example of uh, putting sensors in a tunnel, the, if this metamaterials develops as we see it, you'll be able to do the same thing for roughly one thousandth of the cost per square meter of today's technology, and you will be delivering roughly 20% more data, no power required. That's one example. Another example is using metamaterials that literally when you build something like a uh, tarp, place it on a uh, over a material as long as it has access to the atmosphere, reduces ambient temperature by 5 to 10 degrees Celsius. So think about that for a second. Um, you have the ability then to start impacting the carbon footprint pretty substantially. So why do we know about all this? Well, because a lot of the emerging technologies uh, at the lab level are scattered. Um, and in some cases, we do know about some of this and are trying to employ it. And we have a very conservative process on the way that construction companies, planning companies, and others think about it. And so you know, they don't want to necessarily experiment with some of the new technologies until it's well proven. But then again, you need an incubation capability to make sure you're ready for it when it's here. So there's a lot of disintermediation occurring across the board in emerging technology. 
and what we're trying to do is figure out a way to do a connecting bridge. So one of the other roles uh, that I have, at Stanford at least, is to create a technology fund of approximately $100 million to connect up VCs and venture money here to help develop solutions for problems elsewhere if necessary, and perhaps even someday in the United States if we ever get to the point where we can accept higher taxes to pay for the infrastructure that we lack. Um, and so uh, with that, I'm going to pass the torch to Rich. Great. Hi. Hi um, pleasure to be here. My name is Rich Lechner. I, um, I spent 33 years with IBM um, working on smarter cities, amongst other things. Um, and I would agree that smarter cities isn't necessarily the best uh, term. It's but, trademarked. Uh, but it's, uh, but, but the, uh, um, the idea of digital cities, I don't think, captures the concept entirely either, because I think it leaves out a very important dimension of a smarter city or a more intelligent city, which is the human component and, and the role of the citizens uh, as, as part of that. And I'll, I'll, t I'll talk to that for a moment. Um, at IBM, I was responsible for standing up our sustainability portfolio, which um, grew to be about a $4 billion business that, that's ranged from smarter buildings to uh, intelligent transportation networks to smart grid, our participation in smart grid, to uh, optimizing uh, logistics and supply chains. The, um, as well, I was responsible on the topic of efficiency, because I know there was a lot of talk about that here at this um, function. Uh, I was responsible for leading IBM's internal energy efficiency efforts around IT, and any discussion around digital cities, of course, and, and energy, of course, you, you need to consider the energy signature and requirements of this intelligent infrastructure, including some of the innovations that Michael mentioned. Um, at IBM, you know, as, as you may know, the you know, IT itself is grossly inefficient in its use, getting much better um, thanks to t uh, innovations like cloud technology, but still grossly inefficient. And at IBM, uh, we, uh, through the program we implemented, we're saving over $180 million a year in energy, IT energy costs alone. Um, so uh, pretty significant savings potential. The, um, some, of the, some of the programs that we had to, I had the opportunity to work with around the world uh, included cities like Singapore, where we were implementing an intelligent transportation network, uh, using analytics and, and uh, both uh, static as well as mobile sensors to predict traffic uh, with an accuracy of 90% 30 minutes in advance of where traffic congestion would occur. And then being able to use things like pricing mechanisms to divert an in variable pricing in terms of a bridge or a tunnel to, to divert the flow of traffic to, to those areas that were less congested. So um, lots of ideas about how we can apply here. I'll, I'll, I'll stop commenting now so we can get on to the question part, but hopefully um, we'll be able to answer some of your questions. So, so there's definitely a, a, a series of themes that have, uh, that have emerged in just, just the introductory discussions uh, thus far. Um, so the global perspective on digital cities, the data component, the enabling technologies. Um, and I just want to start with just one one particular uh, point that, that that hopefully you'll you'll sort of leave uh, leave this discussion with, which is this notion of two thirds. So, what does that mean? Where am I trying to get to this? Urbanization is is the critical driver behind this notion of of digital cities, smarter cities, right? So so as we become more urbanized, we need to think more around how does our infrastructure cope with that. So two thirds of the global GDP currently is derived from urban environments, and within the next few years, we're going to have two thirds of the global population living in urban environments, right? So these are cities. Now, what does this mean? This is roughly equivalent to about 600 cities across the world. Now, the most interesting part of all this, again, with two-thirds, is that two-thirds of these cities are going to be in emerging markets. So there's a huge opportunity globally to think about not only how do we take existing cities, like the ancient city of London, and make them smarter and more efficient in terms of the way they deal with the operations, quality of life, security, safety of the citizens, but also how do we imagine and design entirely new cities to cope with the global urbanization that we're gonna see in emerging markets as well. So I have my list of questions and hopefully I won't get a chance to go through them because I'd, I'd like to get you guys involved. But let me just begin with one thing, which is this notion of this discussion going back and forth. Digital cities, smart cities, smarter cities, 
the smart citizen. Um, how, how do you guys see this definition? What do you think that the scope of, of smart cities actually is and should be in terms of the conversation that we're going to have such that we kind of get a, a, a strong foothold? Because it's kind of nebulous. Yeah, I'll, I'll start if that's okay. I, so I would, um, I would say that, you know, you need to think of a city as a system of systems, as sort of a, a, a um, an interconnected set of systems that include energy, water, the built infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, the public services, waste management, et cetera. And then, um, and then secondly, I would say the, the attributes as, as, as IBM and others define smarter cities is it's instrumented, it's connected, and, and getting that connectivity is, is, is critical. Um, it's the application of analytics to the data that's being collected in both historical and in real time, both big data and so-called small data. Um, the, it's collaborative in nature. I think that's incredibly important. Collaboration between the public sector and the private sector, between the public sector, the government agencies, and the citizens is an important attribute. Um, and it's, again, to my point of, of the citizen, it's engaging. A smarter city or an intelligent city is, is engaging. It engages the, the citizens uh, actively. And um, to the point of a lot of the discussions that we've heard earlier, including the debate over lunch, I would say that a, a, a smarter city is distributed in nature. Services are distributed. The, the notion of centralized services is, in my, in my opinion, is not relevant in a smarter city. Whether you're talking about healthcare or power generation and storage, um, these services are increasingly going to be distributed. Uh, so the idea of new, you know, sort of a nuclear power plant in every home probably isn't scalable, whereas solar perhaps is, as an example, or, or, or um, you know, sort of renewable storage is. So I would uh, suggest that you that those things uh, be included. The, the last thing is it needs to be inclusive. Um, too often, the the notion of a smartphone, our smartphone is held up as sort of the the access point, uh, the passport to a smarter city, uh, whether it be for transportation or, or what have you. And unfortunately, not everyone has a smartphone. And so not all of our citizens um, have those devices and those capabilities. So as we define smart cities, they need to be inclusive by nature. I'm going to take a somewhat different tact. Um, <laughs> and that is this. That, um, uh, the human-centered design approach is incorporated in digital technology to a really significant extent that it's so disruptive. I think that the citizens themselves will redefine how a city gets managed just by what they do. So I'll, I'll give you kind of an example of two different ways of thinking about it. Um, there's this really old institution called Lloyd's of London, and they have a fabulous reputation for dealing with insurance risk. And they have a really modern architect building, and inside of it they have all the various insurance companies. And they still carry things around called books to negotiate deals. The biggest problem that they're facing right now is that predictive analytics and some of the work that's being done in the technology is completely disrupting not only their user model, but their business model as well. So one example, um, the National Healthcare Service took a look at distribution of pharma throughout the city, and with the assumption, government's assumption was, uh, everything's working fine. And in fact, everyone's being treated equal, equally in the way that we distribute pharma. So they gave the data sets over to the Open Data Institute, looked at it, and 200 companies started doing the equivalent of hackathons on the data, and did visual maps and discovered there was complete inequality in the way that pharma was being distributed. And in fact, the poorest areas of cities were getting the worst possible service. And when Lloyd's took a look at that and some of the other insurance companies suddenly discovered the kind of power that they could have in figuring out how to get the healthcare services, the hospitals and everything else, changed in the way that they thought about, you know, just primary cost in the healthcare system. If you could actually predict where the problem is based on current information, you could then change the strategy of how you would approach it. And that was driven pretty much by user data that was submitted into the system and by citizens basically asking for more ability to drive change in the system. And so I think the other component of it is also the commercial companies because the governments are always playing catch up and the technology is moving more rapidly than the ability of the policymakers actually to contain it. 
And we can see that with Apple today, just something like the privacy cases against the government. Apple put, pushes the smartphone technology into everyone's hands. Now they're actually challenging whether the government of the United States or any other government could actually get access to the technology themselves. So in many cases, commercial companies inside of the city are actually responding to consumers and the citizens and changing policy before the government actually has a chance to catch up with it. And I actually think that's a good thing. To access, perhaps not, but we need more of the technology disruption to come into the mainstream so that citizens can determine how their city operates more efficiently than in many cases the, the way that the government operates it. So I'll push back on that one. And maybe uh, maybe my, my spin on it is I think the cities are gonna be carbon takers. And the smarter we get towards carbon neutrality, the smarter or digital the city is. What I mean by that, um, I'm a big person that understands uh, the One Planet Living that came out of the UK. And so the idea is uh, <coughs> if we go at the current rate we're going at, we need seven planets to supply all our resources. And so the closer we get to carbon neutrality, uh, uh, that'll be the carbon neutrality. That's a smarter city to me. Uh, for example, we really don't know what our true footprint of these cities are as far as water. We take water and clothing. We don't realize it may be uh, water that was used to wash the clothing in another country and it's imported into our country. Uh, when it was in the Middle East, 90% of the water footprint came from outside the UAE. And so we really need to have a baseline of what we call uh, our footprint is, either on carbon, water, or energy. And then we look at all the things that we import. We've been talking a lot about the demands of a digital city. And a big one is the data management systems and the security associated with that. That was one of the areas we had a big discussion with is, why does Bank X, Y, and Z need their own data management system, which takes up a lot of energy and uh, resources when we could just have one big database that would be able to match them and put a firewall between them. But we can't do that, so thank you. The other areas we're looking at demands on, on the heating, cooling, lighting, and other areas that the, these digital cities will have to have in play how can we get them closer to carbon neutrality? So once we establish what the baseline is, how do we get them closer to neutrality? And that, to me, is a smart city. So that's my spin on it. That's great. And uh, Mike Steep, I actually want to go back to the point that you just made, which is this, this notion of getting the, the commercial organizations involved as being the spearheads of pushing for change. And, uh, and as you can see, sort of my, my bias in, in selecting this panel, um, I don't have any politicians on here. I just have technologists. Um, and, and one of my, my strong, yes, yes, and, and, and yes, capitalists, capitalism at work. Um, and, and one of the things here, which, is, which I believe is true, is the fact that we are now getting into a point where technology is evolving so quickly that it's even difficult for the commercial organizations to keep up with it, let alone the policymakers and the politicians and the, and the folks that uh, may not even have that on their radar. So. But not just the politicians, even the corporations in particular don't have it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so as, as we're thinking about the introduction of, of new technologies to, to help get us to the point of, of carbon neutrality mm -hmm. when we're thinking of the cities, um, what, what do you guys see as being the barriers to adoption and where have you actually seen things work well? Um, Mike, maybe I'll begin with you and then I, I know you guys all have global experience on this. Um, I think where it works well is when you have more of the disruptive technologies coming up from below, either through entrepreneurs or startups. And then within the commercial companies, when you have what I would call maverick leaders. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So um, BMW went through a fairly major change in the way that it manufactures cars in, the, in something called the I-Series. It wasn't just about building electric cars, it was actually about completely changing the manufacturing process, um, actually to a, the throwback days of weaving, where they actually weave carbon now using robots to actually assemble bodies that are 20% lighter but have the same temp strength as steel uh, for the same amount of steel. So they had to rethink the process. That was driven by an executive inside of BMW, a maverick, who wanted to really change the way the company started thinking about production, green, use of carbon, and so forth. The other example is Airbus, where inside of the company they decide to fly a prototype of the first electric airplane. So that in our minds, electric airplane, that must have heavy batteries and stuff, right? Not the case. So they came up with a completely different concept based on sailing. And the America's Cup boat that was designed many years ago, a lot of technology coming out of that was grounds up 
Larry Ellison had put a $40 million of research into it to really build a completely different type of vehicle that could fly on water and then broke all speed records, uh, water speed records when we did it. BMW, Airbus took a look at that whole experiment and thought to themselves, why can't we do something like that for our industry that's highly disruptive? And so the first electric airplane flew from uh, United Kingdom to France about two months ago and came back 165 miles an hour. It had 25% less weight than a typical aircraft carrying the same number of passengers. And the battery technology used an entirely new way of thinking about synthetic casings and with battery sensors built in at the particle level. So they got 30% more efficiency out of the batteries. We used some of the wafer technology that Apple has been experimenting with on its uh, MacBook series. So the innovation was led by a really thoughtful CTO who just wanted to break glass and take the disruption and make it possible to change things. So I think you know, what we have to do now is start thinking about this across the spectrum of emerging technology. It may provide a little bit more direction. And one way of doing that is through the commercialization of it. Um, because the biggest factor here is human factor of change and resistance to change. And what I would call the FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, doubt. It works both ways. It prevents change from happening inside the company or the city. But the other hand, when you have a maverick who comes in and actually may possible to make change happen, it has amazing results in the way that a company will go forward. So that's one way I would, I would take a look at the problem set. I'm, I'm not, I don't believe it's going to be central or come down from you know, pre-existing systems or pre-existing learnings alone. I think we have to really think through a different kind of box here, out of the box, uh, about how we're going to do it. To do that requires tremendous expertise in technology. And that's the missing link in the cities. The, in all of the cities, including here in Silicon Valley. You do not have a technology-focused expertise resident inside the cities to help them figure out, and it's not IT, what they need to do with some of these new technologies and how to actually make it work. And because I lived in Palo Alto, I'll, you know, someday I'm hoping they'll actually time the lights from the technologies of 1930s. <laughs> but you know, that's not actually an area of focus, despite having all this amazing capability all around them. And unfortunately, as technologists, we're not really interested so much in making that happen, unless you know about what's going on abroad. But we need to bring all this stuff home and help Congress and you know, try to break through the barrier. But I think it's going to go through the commercial companies first, because I think the other obstacles are so enormous. Uh, to try to overcome. I sort of have a, I agree with the glamorous part, the iPhones <laughs> and all that. I think we need to go back to basic blocking and tackling. So we haven't had a breakthrough in wastewater treatment in 40 years, or whenever chlorine was about. And so we really need to go, and that will affect all of everybody in this room. Some of this other stuff wouldn't, but we need to take that breakthrough concept and go back to the basics. So that would be, uh, some of the older stuff I call waste management. So we have garbage we generate, what do we do with it? How do we come up to a point where we can 100% recycle or reuse that waste instead of sending it out? We're trying to do it in California, but if you go to the Midwest, you may not find the same type of requirements. So how do we get into that basic uh, talk, tackling and blocking at the, the core things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis and have those innovations come through? A lot of work that we uh, were exposed to is starting to look at uh, nanotechnologies and starting to look at biological systems to manage waste, manage wastewater, and how do we incorporate those into more carbon neutrality, but also looking at how do we have those breakthroughs. We haven't had a breakthrough in wastewater treatment or even water treatment in a long, long time. And I would, I would cite two things, if I could. One is uh, critical to have open interfaces and open data access. Um, I think that that uh, will unleash the, the private sector to help um, create the innovations, fund some of the investments and, and the infrastructure improvements that are required. I think here in California, the, the Green Button program is a great example of, of an open interface, open API. Uh, open data program, and, and you can see lots of different examples. Uh, Powell Energy is a, a Silicon Valley company that uh, I think is a great example of someone who's exploiting the green button data to help farmers to uh, identify leaks in your irrigation systems by monitoring energy consumption of pumps, by tapping into the energy data that the green button program makes available to them. All they need is permission from the farmer and they charge the farmers like $50 a month or $5 a month or something for the program. So 
open interfaces and open data is, I think, the most critical thing. The second thing is this idea, back to this idea of collaboration and partnership, um, the best possible practices. Uh, because again, not every city has the wherewithal to either be built from scratch, like Mazdar, or the, or the, or the financial depth, to, like London, to make these kinds of investments. Um, I think a great example, you know, using technology like cloud computing, like social media, um, the um, colleagues in care is a great example of, a, um, of applying healthcare best possible practices given the conditions of the environment. Started in Haiti after the earthquake to, um, to provide physicians with the best possible options, care options, given the reality of the conditions in Haiti. And now being applied the same best principles across the world to doctors in, in Africa and in Asia and in Latin America and elsewhere. So the, um, I think that's another very important part of this is this idea of collaborative, not collaborative consumption, different thought, but collaboration and sharing of knowledge sharing using some of the technologies that, that are available in digital cities and in the digital world. So um, before we get to the rest of the questions, I want to see if there's anybody on the audience that might have a question of the panelists in terms of the technologies. Bender. Um, so leveraging off of your comment about everything needs to be open and interface and your comment about the technology is evolving so fast. Um, is there anything unique about this digital city or smart city concept that's different than smart anything given that Everything's getting connected, everything's getting smart, everything's getting interoperable, hopefully. And you know, there's a layer that a smart building has on top of it, a layer that Uber has on top of it, a layer that airline has on top of it. So is there something different about the city concept that that layer is, there's some innovation or some Uber analytics that make it different than something else? Or is it just a recognition that it's a customer vertical where there's a government at the other end, so it's going to take a totally different approach? No. from a customer point of view, because otherwise from a cost and rapid deployment and unleashing innovation, one would think that a bottom-up approach where, you know, the, may the best thermostat win and may the best connected car win and may the best, you know, utility system win and then interoperability happens. Well, I think the, it comes back to the very first thing I said, which is a, a city is a system of systems it, it, and it's a living organism. and so. If you look at um, the, the risk of a bottoms-up approach and let every the best thermostat win, not, not that there's anything wrong with a bottoms-up approach, but the, the risk of that is, is that you, you look at, um, at, at discrete elements of the city and fail to, to capture the benefits associated with look, uh, taking a more holistic, systems-wide view and in uh, in addressing some of the, the, in the gross inefficiencies that if you think corporations are inefficient, I, I subject submit to you that cities are horribly, horribly inefficient. But that's what scares me, right? That if you do it top down, it's it's just a, but it has to be a com it has to be a combination of, of things. And again, it doesn't. The city. Right, let me give you an example. I, um, I was at a um, at an event in in London. At the Prince of Wales was running a, a smarter cities event, um, and speaking to the mayor of a of a mid sized Midland city, and he said to me, "Listen, I don't want to be." on the front of this. I was on the bleeding edge of a smart city before. I can't afford to do this. I said, what did you do? And he said, well, we, we spent hundreds of thousands of pounds putting in smart bus stops. And I said, really? And he said, oh, yeah, we, we put in the stuff with the digital signage, you know. And I said, well, who wants that? And, and in the future, you're not going to do that. I said, what you're going to do is the back end. You, as a city, will make the back end investments. You provide access to the data, and then you'll let the, the marketplace provide the front, end in, the front end piece of that to exploit that data. It'll be much more cost effective for you. It'll, be, it'll harness the innovation capability of the masses, while at the same time, because you're providing the back end infrastructure and hopefully the data aggregation, you'll be able to provide a more holistic view uh, of that data as opposed to a lot of discrete pieces. One area. One, one area just to follow up on that is I don't think the smart city has to be self-sufficient. That We need to start thinking about a world collaboration and world hubs and looking at, I call it the Federal Express mentality. So if you have a product that's being produced here cheaper and able to bring it in for your immediate needs, you need to have that relationship set up. 
so far I've seen a lot more stove piping in the political arenas as we start to uh, see what's going on versus the other way, which should be, uh, if I want fruit from Holland, I should be able to fly in and I give them something in return. So there's a balance that has to go there. So if we think that these smart cities have to be completely sustainable on their own, that's really difficult to do. I tried it with Mazdar and it didn't really work out. One other thing that makes uh, cities unique is the massive concentration of people within a network that's easily reachable. So when you have IoT and a whole set of devices focused and concentrated in a very small area, the thing that really gives you tremendous innovation capability is the crossing of the chasm of data layers. And that is going to completely change everything we think about. So if we actually think it's possible to have a centralized, top-down approach, people will change it. Instead of trying to get the masses to do something, the masses are actually going to get us to do something indirectly through commercialization. And so the other problem with a lot of the cities is because of the lack of expertise on the technical side, they do silly things. And instead of thinking holistically across all the different things I could do with technology, I'm going to pick creating smart street lamps alone. And that's going to show me that I'm a smart city. It's a lack of holistic thinking with expertise associated with it that is actually a major problem everywhere. Example, our train system in California. Who would actually build a train system without knowing whether or not you complete it or not? That's one of the great attributes that we have here. So one of the advisors to that board is the head of the largest rail facility in Japan who looks upon it and says, this is craziness. You know, it's absolute craziness that you actually don't have the thing financed let alone actually incorporating the latest technologies because the expertise is not resident within the government to actually figure this stuff out. Yet we have all this great technology and all these great companies here in the Valley. Why aren't we leveraging it? Why isn't there a tech consortium that can provide advice to the local governments of which are supposed to govern the way we live here in the Valley, just as an example, in our own home, home uh, base. So I think the problem set is really lack of expertise and I think it's a a preconceived notion that centralized government planning is, or any kind of government planning alone is sufficient to actually convert a city into something what I would call digitized. Uh, I have a question. My background in the semiconductor industry here for the last 45 years, we have been a technology engine. First it was a semiconductor revolution, then came the internet, then came IoT and cloud computing. If you go back, it is all developed here, right? Star 0x or HP and all that. Question to Michael and Jay is then why the smart city? We have all the component here, but the smart city is coming in London, Singapore, and India. Why not in Palo Alto? That is the question. What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> well, I don't want to bash America, but, and I've lived abroad in Australia, New Zealand, and Abu Dhabi. And um, as Michael has said, it's the masses from the bottom moving that movement toward upwards versus letting the government try and make those decisions for them. The citizens in those groups are demanding those type of renewable uh, sources. They want, the, uh, they want to be green. They want to have an environment that they think 10 decades from now, we think maybe our lifespan, but they're thinking 10 lifespans what am I going to give to my children's children? And that's a mentality that I see outside this, the United States. And in that, ma in that matter, you're going to start looking at how you recycle everything, how you reuse everything, and how you uh, move, move forward. Now you have a, a tool that helps you to monitor that with the databases that we have. But I really think it's coming an upswell from bottom up, and people are really demanding that. Just in corporations, we have a legacy, a culture. So with Prop 13, it's virtually impossible to get any new big project approved without 64% or more of the uh, people voting in favor of it. It's almost impossible. That's why we have problems with one of the contributing problems with uh, funding of BART and some of the other major issues. But it goes beyond that. We're all kind of like operating like a bunch of orchard villages from the 1950s. Uh -huh. We're not coordinating, there's no regional council. It's like we've got 10 different transportation systems in the Bay Area, none of which talk to each other efficiently, right? So it's a human problem. It's not something that is, it's an infrastructure problem and in funding, it's a human problem in understanding what our mission is. We live in the most expensive housing place in the country, yet in the last 10 years, the number of housing units have actually dropped. Why? 
because we're building more commercial office space and wiping out existing residential housing, not one thing. And then we don't build enough housing actually to meet the needs of our citizens. So the Bay Area went from 2.5 million units of housing in, le in less than a decade and actually dropped 2.1 million units of available housing. That's a zoning problem. It's a regional problem. And so until we're ready to start actually tackling some of these tough issues and either changing the way our government works or relying upon commercial to put pressure, like, for example, Facebook, building housing onto their campus because no one else will let them do it, you're going to see this pressure mount and mount and mount. It shouldn't take 45 minutes to go the five miles across the city of Palo Alto from point A to Z during from 3 to 7 o'clock because you imagine the amount of carbon wastage there is and just the gas idling on engines trying to get from point. Why is it so hard to do something as basic as time lights? So the reason we're not getting to actually solve some of these problems is because we're not actually tackling them. We're operating things just the way they were operated almost 30 years ago. And, um, and our infrastructure is depleted. We're undercapitalized. And that's why City of London, which economically isn't doing that great compared to, you know, I mean, they have problems just like we do, has it built into their tax structure. So they have the money available for it. And more interestingly, if you develop new prototypes there, you get funded. You get market research dollars to match um, the funding. So you can take a little bit more risk. The only problem there is the culture, again, because it's not an inherently risk-taking culture like it is here in the Valley. But Mike, also they, they do simulations to show what happens if you don't do it. Yes, they do. They do economic impact studies that are all. pretty interesting. We're in a land of abundance. Yeah. Uh, so this question is for Michael. Uh, so you talked about Singapore uh, traffic uh, information that uh, the cab drivers or somebody was getting. Uh, that, I did not know about I, Singapore. Uh, I did. How is that different than Google Maps information, for example, here? Um, it's it's not significantly different. It's it's the difference is is that in Singapore they're collecting the data both from from fixed gantries as well as from. Um, sensors, mobile sensors based on, on cabs, etc. And then there, we implement an analytics system, you know, in for the Singapore Transport Authority that's actually doing the prediction and they had the they had the will to implement um, pricing mechanisms that would influence driver behavior. So so it, some of this to Michael's point, it's a technology issue, but it's also it's a it's a behavioral issue as well as are you willing to make those trade-offs to, to, to have variable surge you know by the way we accept it with uber we all accept surge pricing with we may not be happy about it but we all accept it right anyone here who uses uber um, essentially that's what Singapore is doing surge pricing um, to influence and they have the back-end infrastructure they they've invested in the IT infrastructure so instead of doing what what was done in smart transportation systems here in the U.S. 20 years ago, which is put in these, these stupid gantry systems, very expensive fixed assets. They spent very little on the data collection, and they invested the money on the data analysis and the data analysis capability at the back end. Right? And then they had the will to implement the variable charging that would change behavior. And like I said, 90% accuracy, they can predict and prevent traffic congestion with 90% accuracy up to 30 minutes in advance. So you're implying you could have surge pricing on the highways here? Sure, on the, on the bridges, sure. Why not, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you have variable pricing on the, Gold, on the Golden Gate Bridge versus the San Mateo Bridge versus the Dumbarton it. Bridge based on traffic conditions? They're doing it in Bellevue. We have it today. Well, you have it today up in Bellevue. But the other thing with Singapore is they started 10 years ago uh, limiting uh, based on license plate number where they were on and even when you come into the city. And then they also uh, have a program where you could, it's reverse tag fees. So when you have a brand new car, which has the best air emission controls, you have a very low price. When you get to 10 years, it's so expensive to own that car. Yeah, the opposite of our situation here, right? right? So we go the other we way. We reward you for driving that 20 year old Ford <laughs> Escort. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I had a question because I'm, uh, you know, Stanford's looking at making this campus smarter. And I'm just curious about, you're talking about the backbone. In, 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 in looking at an entire city, what backbone other than the internet capabilities that we have do you see needing to exist that's being offered either through public 
be regulating agency or what's that backbone look like beyond what we have with internet capabilities basically? So Stanford. I would, I would think. I know uh, what it looks like for a campus because I'm familiar with building energy management systems and yeah. JACES and I just am right. just curious as to what technologies are. So um, at Mass Star City they have the Mass Star Institute which is incorporated right into the core of the city. And they looked at the individual uh, dorm rooms to uh, look at smart appliances. That was a, a GE term that allows them to balance their electrical loads based on the peak power. So if you're trying to boil water at peak hour, it takes you 20 minutes versus if you're off non-peak, it would take you two minutes. So they looked at how the user or the behavior will be adjusted to these constraints to keep the peak power down. So that meant that you don't have all the brown electrons going forth. The other areas they looked at is in the balance between um, passive and active air, air conditioning or heating. So you could have a really thick wall, but no air inside it, or you could have a very thin wall and have your air conditioner on all the time. So you have to kind of figure out at Stanford what, what kind of balance it would be. I guess I guess more asking like in terms of IT investment or you know what, like, we have regulated, we have electric utility, gas utilities, telephone, there's lots of standards, regulations. I've sort of that, that system regulates everything up to the meter, and then beyond the meter is really a customer that makes the decisions about their technology. In a smart city, is there some parallel network relate that's an IT network or a smart city data collection network or something beyond what's already in place in London or there there are multiple networks. Um, with massive amounts of data. Uh, so, for example, I think there's over 20 million oyster card records for the last 10 years of travel data uh, coming into the city and leaving. Uh, and so the difficulty is the chasm, crossing the chasm. So getting one organization, that's a government organization, to read to uh, cross with other data, like street level data, to actually do something. How, uh, once you do that, is enormous. Is it all the same fiber optic network and they're sharing? No, it's not, that's not the issue. That's not, it's as simple as this, is that, you know, we have all this data, it's ours. Telephone, we have all this data, it's ours. And we'll find every reason why not to cooperate, you know, to actually use this. So there's a new technology under development called Query into Encrypted Data. So the first thing I want to do if I'm a government agency that does not want to share data, even though I have to appear that I am going to share data, is to raise my hand and say, privacy issue, the reason we can't do this is because of privacy. There's a new technology that's starting to be applied called query into encrypted data. and makes it possible to say to norm, get to normalize data that's already encrypted without violating privacy rules. And so if we think about it as an IT problem alone, it's insufficient to actually solve the problem. What we have to do is step out of that framework and think more broadly about what is the expertise I need to know about to make the right kinds of decisions and how do I acquire the expertise and then I need to deal with the political problems and you know missile silo cultures or other things that you know you have to deal with and that's the real challenge and what commercial companies are trying to do somewhat successfully unsuccessfully in London is cross the chasm by breaking down some of those barriers by getting commercial demand people getting fed up with the commute people wanting to actually share out their data and opt-in. So once again, you know, using the citizens themselves and the demand to change their lifestyle to actually drive change at the government level. It's slow as molasses, unless it's commercially developed. Okay, so, so on that same topic, you know, London is the, is the most, uh, you know, video monitored city on the planet. Right? Yeah, and for good reason. So, you know, you, you kind of open by talking about how you're gonna have the opportunity to enter your data step into one of these, you know, systems where they're going to track you and give you information. Are tracking you. Exactly. So yeah. at some point, is it going to be mandatory that you participate? It may take some major event, but do you see... The answer, I think, is yes. I don't think there's not doubt in this one, unless you want to somehow... Do you remember the big short movie? There's a, a renegade trader who's fed up with Wall Street, decides to figure out how to cut loose and become his own man going out into the wilderness. And, you know, it's going to get a lot more out of control for the individual because the massive accumulation of information um, is everywhere by everyone. And the crossing of the chasm will only make it worse. So we're actually inherently trusting that these people will actually use the data for good and not 
bad. So right now, the national security laws of a number of companies mean that when I land into Heathrow Airport, I'm actually, all my conversations are being recorded along with all my texts. You know, the secret courts that basically have to decide whether they're allowed to do that, but we already know what that's like. So, you know, I think we have to make the assumption that the world has changed drastically from the time that, you know, we grew up and that for this generation, uh, privacy is no longer an opt-in. And I think that people find shocking, but I think that's the reality of it. Um, you know, uh, the head of uh, Microsoft's um, R&D for online search tried an experiment. Uh, she had three different pieces of um, information about herself, all compartmentalized. She wanted to figure out how long would it take for them actually to reassemble all of the breadcrumbs to figure out who she was. Approximately three seconds. <laughs> she gave it as a task to her engineering team. And then they decide to encrypt everything and try to break it out even more, one and a half seconds on the next round. So it, it's, and that was almost six years ago. So, uh, you know, it has changed. It's something that we are going to have to live with. And our governance model is based on a very old model of governance. It's not based on the realities of modern technology. So that's one of the biggest disconnects we have in addition to culture. That's why I believe that commercial companies are probably the only ones capable of actually driving change through their consumers. So it will help us so, all, you know, in that we'll be more secure. I don't know about that. Yeah. So Rich, on the, on the data side, I mean, this is something that's near and dear to your heart. Yeah, I, I think I know we're running out of time. I, I would say, um, you know, one of the questions that's come up over and over again is how do you pay for all this? Um, and, and I have a point of view on that that, that I suspect Michael won't agree with, but um, so two data, three data That's points, aware. three data points. One, the comments you just made about London, more more monitors per square foot than any other city in the in the world. Um, number two, uh, IBM bought the Weather Channel. I don't know, did you know that? Forget not the television capabilities, but all other assets, the Weather Channel, IBM bought. Why would IBM buy the Weather Channel? Um, and number three, I will tell you, number three, um, the speculation that the reason Apple made a billion dollar investment in DD. Why? I said, what's the common thread? The common thread is data. It's all about data. Uh, IBM bought the Weather Channel because it's data that is incredibly valuable. Whether you're talking about smart agriculture, uh, predicting retail consumer behavior, um, predicting, uh, and they have found a correlation with the airbag, the effective airbags, uh, the date, that the, the consistent weather patterns on the days where they know that the, the actual defective airbags were manufactured, the same weather patterns existed in every case. Um, data. Why did Apple supposedly, or one, one point of view, uh, make this investment in DD? Because they want, not because they want to be the next Uber, but because they want to have driverless cars and they want to understand the passenger and the driver behavior in China. Okay, so how does that, how does that relate to cities? Think about all the data that cities have access to. I think the next grand challenge and the answer to being able to afford the kind of smarter infrastructure we're talking about is monetize, is for cities to find a way to monetize the data that they have. Uh, if they can do that without invading the privacy of the citizens, but the fact is they have the data. They know the migration patterns of me, of you, um, around the city, where we, where we go, where the flow goes, where we, how fast we walk, what storefronts do we stop in front of as we're walking down Market, uh, market Street. Um, monetizing that data will provide more revenues than they could ever dream of. Um, that's and it, all they have to do is follow the pattern in the in the mantra IBM's new mantra, which is, data is the new currency. So I would say uh, I completely agree with you, Rich. And I what? I completely agree Holy with shit! Point. <laughs> what? And, uh, and that's all we have time for. <laughs> I completely agree with you on that point. Except I modify it. <laughs> Predictive analytics is more important than the, than the amount of data that you accumulate. And sure. the devices are simply enabling us to get more of the same. It's by getting predictive, and that's a real hot area, by the way, for any engineering students here. 
<clears throat> predictive analytics is a way to actually see and get insights, um, and, and that actually can change the model pretty significantly. So in the monetization example, if you just took the Lloyds of London example, the billions of dollars of savings just from looking at healthcare procedures, you could certainly tax that if you wanted to. But it, it's going to, again, sell it. take a fundamental uh, change on the part of the way we think about governance to do it. That's why we're having such a big issue in the election right now, the national election. The lack of confidence uh, in our government or the demand that, that believes the government's going to do everything for us when, you know, look at, the, look at what's going on. It's, it's nuts, actually, when you think about it. It's not a rational approach. Anyway, enough said. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to do something um, a little bit more, more maverick. I think that, that word was used. Which is to allow for more time for you guys to actually interact with the panel um, leading up to the thing. But, but the one thing I actually did want to close, uh, to close on actually is, is one question but one, one observation actually to, to address the vendors. Uh, the other thing that's happening with cities is that the business model is changing. Um, and, and I hi highly encourage you to actually uh, look into this notion of public-private partnerships. Actually, one of our students here, Dave Wingate in the back, is actually one of the, the experts here uh, at Stanford on this notion. Um, the notion of a, of a public-private partnership is actually changing the business model with which infrastructure is actually deployed and developed. So one of the ones that's actually near, you know, near us right now is the construction that's happening just on the south side of the Golden Gate Bridge. So that new parkway that's in place is privately owned. A lot of you probably didn't realize that because there's no associated toll road with it. But in fact, it's actually a, a privately owned uh, enterprise. It's actually owned by this um, corporation called the Golden, the Golden Link Partners, where they're responsible for designing, building, financing, and most importantly, operating this asset. How do you operate something? You need to have predictive analytics and data that helps you minimize your costs. And for the first time ever, we're now starting to get into a, a, a world where managing long-term infrastructure costs actually makes sense versus making a political decision and hoping you're in office for four years, right? So that's the other thing that could be really, really interesting, and you see a lot more of this happening elsewhere. This is the first P3 that's actually happening in California. It's crazy. It's the first time, right? Despite this, it's, it's not new. We're definitely not originators of this. So, so the one parting question that I want to say, aside from the fact that the business model is changing, is what is one thing that you think that Silicon Valley can help do to contribute to a better quality of life and, and, our, and our push towards more intelligent living environments, cities, whatever you want to call them, locally? Is there, is there something that you think that we could do here to help push this? Is it speaking to the, the officials? Is it designing the technologies? Is it moving to London? <laughs> Yeah, so well, well, maybe I, I Go think ahead. Uh, more re uh, regionalization thinking versus I'm Palo Alto and I'm cool. And uh, <laughs> San Carlos and I'm even better. And, <laughs> but thinking more on partnerships <laughs> versus yeah. competition. And so you could, <laughs> as partners, you could have competition to see who's the best. But you should really be looking at a regional solution to a lot of these issues versus uh, I'm Palo Alto and I'm going to lead by example. I would take the 10 billionaires and um, bring them together and start talking about a new mission besides making money mm -hmm. other shareholders. And the new mission is to actually start having influence on how to build a community and mm -hmm. what the needs are. Uh, money, and it's essentially here, uh, accounts for a lot in terms of uh, where things head, unfortunately. That's just the truth. So there's almost no engagement level that I can see of some of the great leaders here that we have on the commercial side, whether, you know, at Apple and other companies. They just build fancy houses. Well, yes, um, which is their right to do so. But I think that, and the expertise, that's the other part of it. We have such an amazing talent here. I mean, I'm overwhelmed with the opportunity that we have with uh, what's happening with emerging technology. So we're now applying it to things that can change the basic quality of life for, for our citizens, and we could. And so that's kind of what we need to start thinking about, not have this independent view the government's responsible for doing everything. I would, I would echo that. I think this notion of a sort of a, a much more U-shaped government where there's 
much where where there's the government, the citizens, and then perhaps the private sector acting as a bomb of that you and, and facilitating and, and sharing best practices, sharing technology capabilities, um, ideas on how to monetize data and apply new business models uh, in this space. I think uh, is the is the best thing that that um, Silicon Valley can do to, to help. Well, great. So on that note, uh, I'd like to. Uh Thank you, panel, for taking time. And